Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, it feels great to be here. And I, uh, I promise you, Elke and I didn't uh, speak with each other before, but I want to start exactly <laughs> where Elke ended. <laughs> because for me too, I mean, for you it might be normal or without a thought that the chief innovation officer of a tech company is standing here in front of you. But for me, it's far more. It's far more personal because I also truly believe that AI will, what we call, democratize robotics. Today, only very few people have access to robots, and you need a lot of programming and a lot of skills to use them. Um, and also, there are also limits in how we use them. Um, and I want to take you on this journey now um, and show you what we believe is possible and why I'm so passionate. Uh, that robotics will be freeing up people from dull, dirty, and dangerous jobs. Now, yeah, I've been asked, Kuka, are these the orange robots? Yes, they are. And Kuka has come a very long way. We celebrated 125 years history last year, and we started actually, our founders started with street lighting. They were disrupted in their first five, six years of existence and had to move on again. And we also have had times where we built uh, garbage trucks, sock knitting machines, and now we're here at Robotics. And I think you believe me when I say KUKA is a company that has innovation and change in its DNA. Now, um, let me start um, with a question to all of you. Would you want to have a household robot who does your chores, yes. setting the table, doing the dishes, cleaning the bathroom. Can I see the ha your hands? Who wants that? Cool. <laughs> I need to raise mine, too. Where are they? Why don't we have them? We'll, the only thing we have is that um, robot uh, vacuum cleaner. Let me take you along and show you why we don't have them and why we think um, what we think is necessary and how AI can help that we probably get one of these in our homes soon. One of the reasons why we don't have them yet is what's called Moravec's paradoxon. Moravec found out that what's easy for robots is difficult for humans, and what's easy for humans is difficult for robots. I give you an example. Take the left robot here, um, lifting a car. The robot can do that 24-7, up and down. Imagine a human doing it. Not so easy. And definitely not 24-7. On the other hand side, think about a toddler building a tower out of bricks. Very little kids can already do that. And this is very, very difficult for robots. Why is that? Because in reality, learning to or building a brick tower is a very, very complex process. We need almost all our senses to do so. It's seeing, it's grasping, it's moving, and it's even hearing when the block touches the other block. And another topic for us humans is the way we learn. We learn from experience. A toddler has grasped and done a lot of other things before it maybe grasps its first brick ever. But it might already know with any, tri any other trial and error on that brick how to grasp it. And for a robot, that's not possible. So they don't learn from experience, at least not now. OK, so before I dive into concrete examples of AI at KUKA, um, let me bring you um, or get uh, to a more general level. I think we have come quite a far way from the first Industrial Revolution, which was driven especially by steam power, to the second Industrial Revolution, which was driven by mass production, to the third, driven also by automation. You already see the first robots um, on that picture to where we are now at the fourth industrial revolution, which is especially characterized by cyber physical system. What do I mean with cyber physical system? 
for us, it's the tight integration of computational and physical elements with a network communication between them. Now, why do I stress that? Because this is where the challenge for the robot starts. It's still fairly easy for us to record data from a machine and process it into the cloud. Sending back the relevant data to the robot in real time and then make a physical movement with that result, that's the real challenge. <clears throat> and this sending back and having the movement that you really want is still a topic global researchers are working on. And complex tasks today can be solved by 70 to 80%. Now imagine a, car, a robot welding your car, or a robot moving bottles from A to B and packing them into boxes. 70 to 80% might not be enough, right? Or let us go back to where we started. Imagine your household robot cutting bread, putting some butter on it, and your kid is coming in and wants to grab a slice. Now, the challenge is not to teach the robot to cut the bread. The real challenge is that it cuts the bread 100% of the time, nothing else, and definitely does not harm your kid when it grabs the slice. Right? So we're still working on that. <laughs> and if you want to take two things home with you about AI and robotics, then it's that we are trying to solve and that we are going to use um, the, all the power that we have to make the robots still being 100% reliable and 100% safe. That's what it needs to use AI and robots together. I was talking about butter on bread. So for the German-speaking people, let's put some butter by the Fischer now in my first example. The fish industry is also um, facing a lack of workers. Maybe for the fish industry, it's even harder than for other industries because of the challenging environment and working conditions, to put it lightly. Um, so, for us humans, det um, distinguishing fish from one each other is very easy. And here, Moravec's law cuts in, comes in again. What's easy for humans is difficult for a robot. So, the, for, the, for a robot, it's very difficult Number one, to identify the fish. Number two, to grasp them. And number three, then to sort them into the right places. And the special thing about fish now, they are not like a box or a sheet of metal. They are soft, flexible, glibbery. Depending on the light, they can be shiny or not. And when you want to grab them, they can easily how to say that, fall out of your grippers, hands. Um, and yet for us humans, um, it's easy to distinguish a cod from a herring. And if I tell you, put the cods in this box and the herring in the other, you might know um, without any teaching what to do. Because for us humans, all the fish, the, the herrings are similar, or the cods are similar. They are not identical. There are no two fish that are completely identical, but they're very similar. And we humans, we can do that. But a robot can't. For the robot, similar is different. And without AI, that means that we have to, teach, uh, to program every movement for every single fish. And that's just time-wise not possible and financially also not sound to do that. So we have started um, a research project with industrial partners and other research partners. Um, and <clears throat> we, try, um, we trained um, our neural network first with artificial fish. 
I brought you one of them. <laughs> My colleagues said I could have everyone, <laughs> everyone they had. So we trained it um, with the fish. First in our lab, um, what you see on the left, um, on these two pictures. Um, and we need the help of um, sensor technologies, cameras, and AI. Um, and then we learn to grasp the fish and sort it into the boxes. After we trained with the artificial fish, we went to the customer side and we trained with only 10 real fish. And the fish looked like in the picture before, they almost had all the same color, so not as colorful as our training fish were. And um, we, were so, uh, we ourselves were quite surprised because we managed to grasp 100% of the fish in the right position and put them into the right box. So let us have a look at that. So this is at the customer's factory, the fish factory. All right, looks still very slow, right? So to, um, we still have a way to go before we really can free up people from these difficult work conditions. So we are on our way, but it's still some way to go. Now let's move from shiny fish to shiny metal in my next example. Exactly opposite of the KUKA headquarters in Augsburg, there's a company called Walter Fensterbau. The company is celebrating its 330th anniversary this year. They are owned by the family Walter in the 11th generation. And they built windows and doors out of wood, out of aluminium and um, plastic and aluminium. These are the aluminium profiles. They come in different lengths. The shortest is 33 centimeters. The longest is 3 meters 30. Besides the variations in length, they have 20 different variants of these profiles. And again, you hear me <laughs> already very similar to profiles, all aluminium. They for our eye, look also very similar, but they are not identical. Now, um, can I go back? Yeah. Um, when we, we are working with Walter Fensterbau on an innovation project about which I can't talk. Yet, when we went there, um, we saw a huge potential for an increase in efficiency in a couple of their processes. And when we talked with um, the, the owners, they really were interested in applying robotics and automation in their shop floor. But efficiency wasn't their driver at all. It was lack of workers. They offer, for years, they offer eight places for apprentices every year. They got one this year. They are looking for months now for a Fachinformatiker. They didn't find one, they didn't get one application. So for them, there's no other choice. Um, if they want to sustain for another 350 years, they have no other choice than to invest in automation. And yet, we don't see um, robots in companies like these, like the small and medium-sized um, enterprises, the craftsmen uh, on the shop floors. There's very little robots, if any. And why is that? So I take you along. I talked already about the 20 different profiles that they have. Um, and the profiles, they are transported in so-called buffer carts. So they are stacked here. 
and there are, they have five different types of these buffer cards. They are all different in color. They are different in the way the profiles are stacked. And they are very different uh, regarding the separation bars between the stacks of profiles. You see in the middle one, you see there are very straight bars, and then some of them go a little bit lower, some go up. So again, very similar, not identical. And then you see here um, in the bigger picture that um, here there's a, a red rubber that protects the profiles, but due to tear and wear, some are gone, some are ripped, some are complete. And again, if we think about um, automating that, um, the, ver the variety is very huge. The profiles are brought in these buffer cards um, to uh, the welding station. This is already an automated welding station, and usually um, a worker is taking a profile out of a card, feeding it into um, that machine. And then in addition to uh, the profiles, every profile needs a specific in, in German, it's called Flügelblock. It's a specific block that goes with each profile. They also come in very different variations, different colors, different sizes. Now, that company is extremely digital. They try to avoid paper everywhere, so the worker can check on a monitor which profile goes with which block together into the machine. <coughs> Now, if we would want to automate all these steps, um, then it would mean that we, um, we would need to program every size of profile, every variant of profile, move it to the welding station, put up, bring the, the blocks into it, into the right position. And you hear me already, um, the, vari the variations are far too many to be able to program that. And if we would want to program it in the traditional way, it would mean that the company will need um, a person just, they need a robot programmer on site to currently reprogram um, the robot. And actually, for the few robots that we see in shop floors like these today, uh, the biggest problem why there are robots that are not used anymore is that they don't have a programmer who can reprogram it once they have a new contract for a new type of product. So this is something where now AI kicks in. And also here, AI, wi AI will be the game changer. Um, Elke used the same word, so um, I had to smile when I listened to you, because we too believe that we can, when the system can learn um, that similar what similar means for profiles, what similar means for f the blocks, what similar means for buffer cards, and also for the movements, then it will become far easier for robots. And we will partly close the paradox on um, that Moravec detected. And it will become at least easier for robots to do the things that are easy for humans. Now, we use AI here for identifying the objects, and for grasping the objects. We also use AI for something that's very important and in, uh, has a special terms that I would want to share with you. It's called collision-free path planning. What is that? For a robot, imagine it has six axes, and of course you can move your arm like this, look at the elbow, but you can also move it like this. And we always have to calculate and plan what is the best and most, the fastest and the most energy efficient way for the robot to make a movement. Um, and here with the view into the box, you can imagine that a robot, if you don't tell him about the environment and you don't tell the robot which path it has to choose, it might want to grasp something in the box and hitting the wall and destroying it because the force of a robot is quite strong. So we. For everything we want to grasp, we have to tell the robot um, where to go, how to go there. That's the better variation. And now we can also use AI here. We can't use it 100% because of safety and reliability, but we managed, our researchers managed to combine AI with traditional methods of path planning, and we managed to save 25% of time for path planning. Now, in a 
eight hours a day, that would mean two hours per day. Think about multiple applications that you have in your companies and think over a year how much time that would be. So already with that, AI is increasing uh, the efficiency. Now, I have spoken about so much about um, uh, uh, the, the shop floor, and this is actually what we see coming next. And the Chen AI hype is also good for us because also traditional uh, machine learning gets more attention. And I truly believe that we will see in the coming years what we call the democratization of robotics. Elke spoke democratization of uh, information. So I think it goes AI. I think that's the potential of AI. It's, it's spreading. It's, it's creating um, a, a more level playing field. And there are a lot of jobs out there in the world that are dull, that are dirty, and that are delicate. Um, but also a lot of uh, ones that are really, really dangerous for people who do that. And we believe that we will see robots who take over these type of jobs, not your creative part um, of these craftsmen, but the part of their jobs that are really not adding value um, and that are especially very dangerous. Now, we are on the journey. Um, I invite you to um, connect with us and innovate and collaborate with us together. And if you in the future ever find yourself debating with your household robot who should do the dishes, remember that it might only want to avoid the crash course in dishwashing. Thank you very much. <laughs>